today is Drew Bidicall, and he has changed his screen name to ask questions here. So if you are joining us via Zoom, you have the opportunity to ask questions during our program, and you can do that uh, uh, by either, uh, let me see if I can advance my slides. Uh, you can do that by either uh, dropping the question in the chat. Um, you can, if you I would like for everyone to see that you can type the question there directly to everyone, or if you would like to keep that question private, you can uh, type that in um, after you select ask questions here as the person to send it to. Uh, we can also, we are also simulcasting the program via YouTube. And so that's a live program there as well as uh, it will be recorded and can be viewed there at a later date. Our agenda today uh, we will begin with our weather report with uh, Pat Ganan, and then uh, we have a, a producer question that we will be slipping in there between the weather report and our program, which is uh, planning your 2022 forage program uh, with, doctors, uh, with Dr. Eric Bailey and Tim Schnockenberg. And so, uh, Dr. Ganan, if you are ready, I will uh, let you have the floor. I am, thank you, Valerie, and, and good afternoon, everyone. Well, meteorological winter is behind us, but you'd, you'd never know it when you look outside today with the current snow event impacting parts of Missouri. Um, little historic perspective here in the upper left. These are all the winters in Missouri going back to the late 1800s. And I put a running mean trend line to show in pink the warm, uh, winter periods versus some colder periods that like we saw in the 70s, late 70s. But you can see overall uh, the trend uh, that for this winter really follows what we've been seeing over the past few decades. Since about the early 1990s, three of our top or four out of our top four warmest winters have occurred. And right here is uh, just this past December, January and February. It ranked a little over three degrees above average. Uh, I, I always like to, you know, when you look at the winter, though, it doesn't really tell the whole story of what we've seen here in Missouri. And this, that's image, this, this image right here looking over the past, um, well, since December of last year, we actually had a winter last year that was below average, even though two thirds of the winter last year was actually warmer than average. But we had that really cold spell in February, and that tilted the, the trend for a colder than average winter because of those extreme cold conditions we saw last February, last year. But look at this, when we go to the more recent winter, of course we had a, 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 an exceptionally warm December. It was the warmest December on record for our state. And even though January and February, actually here in Missouri, were a little bit colder than average. Uh, so two thirds of the time we were below average, but this extreme warmth we saw in December translated to an above normal winter. So welcome to Missouri in regard to how patterns can change and be go from one extreme to another. But nonetheless, this winter will go down as being a warmer than average one, thanks to what we experienced in December of last year. On the right, these are precipitation departures for the winter, a little bit again, a tale of two stories. Generally, the southeastern third of the state has been wetter than average this past winter. That's indicated by the greens, but as you go north and westward, that's below average conditions. So we still have somewhat drier weather conditions this winter across much of the northwestern part of the state. Again, wetter as you go southeast, but the overall statewide average was about 6.68, which actually turns out to be slightly above average, but indeed a little bit different story. Drier north, wetter to the south. Current conditions are, of course, very cold conditions. I mean, right now we're, we're well into March and generally highs, average highs are in the 50s, lows in the 30s. And look at these cold temperatures as of about 20, 25 minutes ago, only in the teens across northern parts of the state, generally in the 20s and central sections. Obviously, you can see a boundary <clears throat> that exists across southern Missouri where temperatures are still in, well into the 40s, even in the 50s in parts of the boot hill. So a big temperature gradient, uh, that's where that boundary is laying right across Southern Missouri. So all temperatures, uh, much colder conditions, generally a frost line still exists across Northern Missouri. That's why where the snow is falling, it's sticking for the most part. But as you go further South, th that lighter snow that's falling is actually melting because of the above uh, freezing conditions on the road surfaces. 
thanks to these warmer soil temperatures and much milder conditions as you'll go across Southern Missouri with soil temperatures generally in the upper 40s to low to mid 50s. Uh, the map here on the bottom shows the, the road conditions from the, the, the Traveler Missouri Department of Transportation, the Traveler map showing the snow covered roads across those colder surfaces where the snow has been falling and sticking across Northern Missouri. A little bit better conditions as you go south, partly covered across central parts of the state. And of course, it's all clear across southern Missouri in regard to the current road conditions. Right now, we're, we are under, being impacted by a system that, that boundary to the south of disturbance and moving along that boundary is triggering light snow across parts of Missouri. Right now, currently across much of west central Missouri, we're seeing some light snow falling. Uh, winter storm warnings are in effect for today and to tonight. Winter weather advisories for lighter snow accumulations. That cold air is going to penetrate throughout southern Missouri, and that snow belt will gradually sink southward into southern parts of the state as we go into tonight and tomorrow. The upper right shows the Same forecast of snowfall that that through the next 24 to 48 hours. You can see that heaviest pocket of snow in anywhere from four mm -hmm. to five, even six inch totals are forecast across west central Missouri. Uh, lighter amounts, but nonetheless impactful amounts that could run from two to four inches across much of the rest of the state. So something to keep an eye on with these worsening conditions as we go into tonight and tomorrow. The thinking is, is that snow belt will shift to the wet to the south, uh, perhaps re-intensify overnight, bringing more accumulating snows across the southern half of the state. These are the forecast temperatures from for today through uh, Saturday morning. These are much below normal temperatures. These is, are as much as 20 degrees below average. Look at the low temperatures on Saturday morning. Of course, with a fresh snow blanket across the state, those snow temperatures can drop to the single digits. Very cold conditions considering we're entering the middle part of March. So highs today generally getting colder across Southern Missouri as that boundary sinks, sinks through the state. High or lows tonight, generally in the upper teens to low 20s. Highs tomorrow in the lower 30s. Again, that's about 20 degrees below average. Cold conditions Saturday morning and cold continuing on into the day on Saturday. But once we get beyond Saturday, things are gonna change. You know, it's what we've been experiencing. I, I, we, we've been experiencing these roller coaster temperatures uh, generally since the beginning of the year, just up and down. They call it weather whiplash. With, much, uh, with above normal temperatures translating to below and back and forth. But anyway, we'll get to these cold conditions through Saturday, but look at these temperatures rebounding on Sunday, generally getting close to 60 degrees, back to above average. And that looks like it's gonna persist through much of next week. So let's get through this cold snowy period. Looks like much nicer weather as we start the end of the weekend and through much of next week. Look at these highs in the 70s as we get into Wednesday and Thursday. So obviously that snow will be a memory as we get through Sunday and into next week. This is the forecast of precipitation over the next five days, the majority of, of it, which will, will fall between the next 24 and 48 hours, generally about a quarter, perhaps as much as up to a half inch. I will say there is another system that could impact Southern parts of the state uh, Monday night into Tuesday, bring some uh, rain chances across far southern Missouri. But for the most part, these are totals here across the rest of the state uh, that are currently um, affected by the current system we're seeing impacting Missouri. This is a forecast for next week that'll start from mid-March, mid-March 15th through the 19th. Looks like a fairly high likelihood across much of the north central and northeastern parts of the state um, of the country all of Missouri, there is an enhanced likelihood of above normal temperatures uh, that will be welcome to see. More uh, drier conditions across the upper Midwest, Northern Plains, maybe perhaps more near normal conditions with the system impacting us by mid to later next week. And above, wetter, above normal or wetter conditions across the Eastern parts in the Pacific Northwest down into parts of um, uh, Colorado. And Valerie, that's pretty much a weather report. I'll hand that back over to you and, and thank you so much. All right, thank you very much. I'm, I'm glad to know what the official term was, that weather whiplash. I, I, <laughs> we've been experiencing a lot of that. I like that weather whiplash. Um, so we, we appreciate you taking time every uh, time we have a town hall to share the weather report with us. Weather makes a, has a, such a large impact on 
uh, our forage livestock system. That is a valuable piece of information. So thank you. Um, we're going to move on. Our next um, item on the agenda is a producer question. Uh, if you uh, sign up for the Forge Livestock Town Hall through the ipm.missouri.edu website, uh, you have the opportunity to ask questions. And so this is a question that came in via the website and Tim Schnockenberg is going to answer that for us. And so uh, the question is, we graze fescue and round bale hay. Uh, we have also have done some baleage and have a wrapper. Uh, we'd like to plant a good forage for hay or baleage this year on 20 acres, looking for suggestions. So. Uh, Tim, uh, if you would like to answer that, uh, we would appreciate it. Thank you. Sure, Valerie. Um, there's there's a lot of scenarios here that we could directions we could go if we had a little bit more information. But really, this this gives us a good good direction. Uh, the fact that they've got uh, the opportunity to wrap some uh, baleage gives them a, a lot more um, things that they could try in their in their toolbox. Um, you know, the first thing out the chute uh, as we go into the, the growing season for hay might be oats. Um, we've had several producers in Southwest Missouri who have planted oats. Uh, we're getting a little on the late side here in, in South Missouri, but possibly as we, uh, as you go North, you could still be planting some. I'm not saying you can't do it now, but um, oats would be a good option. I know um, we have probably better uh, success planting oats where there's a little bit of tillage in law versus no-till, especially in the spring. Uh, I know a few producers that can do some no-till but uh, successfully, but it seems like if there's a little tillage, it seems to work better. And, and I say that unfortunately, but um, you know, we've talked about the opportunity of using rye or triticale or wheat in the spring. I shy away from that a little bit because um, they would not have the opportunity to go through what we call vernalization that allows that seedling to kind of uh, be prone to put out a seed head in the spring. And as a result, we don't have as much um, incentive by that plant to grow out and really make some tonnage. So I tend to shy away from those in the spring um, unless it was already planted last fall. Um, the other option after that might be to plant a warm season grass annual. Uh, such as the sorghum sedan grass varieties or hybrids, uh, pearl millet, or even an improved crabgrass variety. I will tell you this, um, we've been studying at the Southwest Research Center, there's been a, a variety trial uh, for sedan grass hybrids. And, and I've been kind of amazed at the new traits that are out there. Uh, many of you are, are familiar with the brown midrib trait, trait, which is been an outstanding way to get some better um, quality in our sorghum sedan grasses. Um, there's also what's called brachytic dwarf uh, uh, traits that are there. There's photosensitive period traits. There's um, even sugarcane aphid tolerance that they're working on right now and, and some herbicide tolerance. And so uh, within the industry, uh, there's some good things happening in the sorghum sedan grass. Uh, world. So that would be, those would be my suggestions at this point. All right. Thank you very much. We appreciate you uh, answering that question for us. Again, if, if you as a producer have questions that you would like us to address during our uh, Forge Livestock Town Halls, uh, you can do that by going to the ipm.missouri.edu website uh, and you can submit your questions from there. Um, we're going to move on now to our program. Our program this uh, today is planning your 2022 forage program. Tim Schnockenberg is going to address that from the forage perspective, and Dr. Eric Bailey is going to address that from the livestock perspective. So I will stop sharing my screen and give uh, those gentlemen the opportunity to uh, begin uh, that program. All right, can you see the screen okay, Valerie? Yes, we can, thank you. Okay, we'll talk a little bit. Uh, I'll kind of start out the discussion, discussing as we're uh, going into the spring. Um, and I felt like probably the most ap applicable thing to talk about in the amount of time I had was to kind of discuss about the spring flush and how do we deal with that excessive that 
And so um, uh, that's what I want to uh, today. And then as we go uh, as into it a little bit, I'll get into some of the summer, summer growth that we deal with. So here's where um, we are, or we're getting close. I mean, we have a lot of uh, folks that are spring calvers still, and uh, uh, you know, there's a lot of calves on the ground. Um, grass is really short. Um, we uh, we often, you know, go from this point to this point in just a record amount of time. It's really amazing how fast we can change and growth can come on very, very soon, even as we get into April and certainly by May. Uh, we sometimes end up with, well, we always end up in most cases with more grass than we know what to do with in most cow-calf operations across the state. And so um, I want to address that a little bit. There are some things that we know regarding growth rates. Um, I can tell you this, even uh, it catches agronomists off guard sometimes, just how fast it grows. Uh, but most producers are, are uh, caught off guard by that growth explosion that occurs in the springtime. It will vary a lot between years. Um, you know, just the different uh, winters that we have and what we've been, been, at, been in and, and, and the kind of growth that we have based on moisture and, and uh, uh, sunlight that's happening in the early spring. And then we also know that soil temperature drives that break in dormancy pretty fast. That's really uh, probably one of the primary drivers as far as breaking dormancy. And then uh, many of us dealt with some ice in recent weeks, and I know uh, that has slowed down some of the uh, some of the um, cereal uh, crops that we had last fall. And so that's going to grow the long the snow some of us are getting uh, today and tomorrow. Slow down our growth as well. Um, you know that um, the with rest. So anytime that we the roots are in good healthy condition because we have not over, over grain, uh, will accelerate and it can rebound and even come out of the ground when it hasn't been gnawed to the ground. And then something I'll address a little bit later is how nitrogen speeds that growth. So the first question is when when do we start? And uh, I had this question just last week and I must say it depends. Uh, if you read some of the, the, some good extension literature that's out there across the country, which I have in recent days, uh, thinking about this talk, um, you'll find people that will say, um, you know, it, we, we start way too early, we need to delay it. And then others will say, no, we got to start earlier. And I'm, I'm going to kind of straddle the, the fence a little bit on this one because this is one of those situations that I believe it depends. Uh, it depends on how you've been grazing over the winter, uh, and it depends on your future strategy for the, for 2022. Uh, so if you're um, grazing very close uh, coming out of winter, you, you've pretty well grazed everything into the ground, which a lot of producers have. Um, and also if you are uh, lar have large paddocks and you do extended grazing in each of those paddocks and, and you, you're not moving them very much, I would say delay, uh, maybe hold off, uh, you, you know, keep, keep your sacrifice paddocks and delay a little bit longer until you can get maybe oh seven or eight inches of growth. Um, however, I think um, in, in situations where we have a lot of paddocks, we're doing management intensive grazing, short-term grazing, a uh, little winter, and then also we have little winter grazing or we've left some residual out there, I think we can resume. We may wanna get started, uh, gotta start the season and maybe resume at four inches or so. We do know that, you know, we get too far ahead of you. It's going to limit our nutrition. Dr. Bailey address a little bit later. Uh, and then also those frost seeded legumes that we have put in the ground uh, this, this winter. Uh, some of that's going to relate, going to be shaded, uh, probably acceptable for the growth to get too far ahead of us. The second point here is, I think the urge to fertilize. I think we want to get out and 
and help that grass grow. And I know this year with the higher price of fertilizer, there may be less of this this year than, than normal, though there will be. But uh, I think we need to restrain the urge to fertilize early. Uh, and and much, much of that depends on stocking density. You see the picture up on the upper right-hand side uh, where there's a lot of cattle. They're using, they're moving them on in smaller areas. Uh, I think, um, you know, that might be a situation where we would want to fertilize early. But in most cow-calf and stalker operations that we have in Missouri, I think the grass gets ahead of us too quick. And uh, we end up with grass. on let's say in first of March, which you might want to do in uh... Tim, I think we lost you. I can see your slide, but I can't hear your audio. Okay. Yeah, I'm not sure what happened. I've. Uh... I can hear you now. Okay. Um, so as far as nitrogen is concerned, um, we might want to consider putting the idea of bringing uh, our forage into the summer a little bit further. as palatable and then next and end up with a lot of excess forage that we don't have enough cows to get utilized. So uh, this is the thinking behind that. Pastures quickly as we go into the summer is, or into the spring is a good idea. I will say management intensive grazing is the best approach. And so there's a lot of merit to that. Um, try to move both the top, top graze it. Uh, we're not necessarily gonna get it down to four or five inches at this point, but just kind of do a top grazing. Um, we try within the first 30 days and that kind of helps keep it in a little bit more vegetative um, state. And then as the summer comes on, it gets a little warmer and move on to the next paddock. And all this, again, is a dependent, dependent factors there that some of the work that's been in Missouri uh, shows that, you know, leaving a residual height accelerates that growth rate. And so if you can leave your residual height behind your growth rate, come back a lot quicker. And it's, it's simply the fact that we're not depleting the carbohydrates We can have and let her out and survive. Will be better. Uh, this is something I'm throwing out. Density, and I'm not saying we should. I'm just saying I don't think in Missouri producers have that kind of to do that, but in. Buy some stalker and uh, the temporary forward. Uh, and it's a short term one and uh, involves a lot more planning and study and
monitor a forage supply, whether you're using a grazing stick that you might have gotten at a grazing school. Testing and the technology is there now called Paddock Track that Brian Locke is working in. Fairly quickly on a four wheeler, monitor that growth and then enter. To move into next, a um, lot of merit to this. I think we're we're going to see. Um, I'm not saying that we have to do this on every acre, but um, when it's in the vegetative, still in the vegetative stage, go, getting ready. Do it for this, these reasons, don't delay in doing it. The other option is to This basically resets the pastures, keeps them vegetative. Um, Alage uh, in the spring, so be aware of that. But uh, do it too late in the year, uh, those pastures can recover maintain some be rocky or not really something you'd run a hay, uh, hay machinery over. Uh, great data that's come out of the university that Ryan Locke shared with me um, by being rotated versus cattle that had a silage. Also, um, cattle that were fed dry distillers grains uh, in a rotational system. And it's interesting that the average daily gain by these summer calves were actually fairly equivalent in Uh, they were lower in just rotating. So I, I think this kind of speaks to the the, the crude protein. Uh, you can see the green bar. Um, than the control and the distillers. Uh, side. All right, as I kind of wrap up here, keep up with the forage, all is not lost. Uh, if it gets too rank, the ergot infested seed heads, uh, which I have become more and more aware of. Toxic scenario, um, probably a little more toxic in that scenario than The other thing that can happen is summer stockpile. And uh, just wrap up with this one because um, summer stockpile is something we're hearing a little bit more of these days. In some of that we may not get, to, I'm not gonna get 
Um, you know, I think when we take maybe a hay operation off the farm or we don't have to dedicate as much of our ground to a hay baling operation, it can help get that grazing going uh, late summer when we really need it the most. But some of our fescue paddocks, uh, we might have some excess forage that we can utilize and also utilize in the fall as the Uh, so Virginia Tech has done some good research in this. I've studied this a little their summer with summer stockpile, they increased their grazing days by about 65 days and significantly lower their hay feeding days as a result of doing this. So has some merit. What I had to share, I think I stayed within my timeline, um, but if there's any questions, I'd be glad to entertain those now. All right, thank you very much, Tim. Um, Druba, do we have any questions at this point for Tim? No, not any questions so far, Valerie. Okay, thank you, we appreciate the, that. Thank you, Tim, we appreciate you taking time to um, share that with us. Uh, we had a little bit of issue with your audio occasionally, so if someone has a question, make sure you type that in the chat and we will get Tim to uh, fill in any blanks if we uh, miss something on the audio. Uh, at this time, Dr. Bailey is going to uh, address our forage uh, program from the livestock perspective. So, um, Dr. Bailey, if, uh, you have the floor. Thanks, Valerie. Good afternoon, everyone. I am glad to get to contribute the animal portion of our planning a forage program in 2022. You know, we really can't plan a forage program or plan a, a beef cattle operation without considering how the two factors influence upon one another. Then when you throw recent world events on top of all of this and the dramatic escalation in feed, fuel, and fertilizer prices that we've seen, it, it really gets for a challenging time figuring out how to make this deal pencil this year. And so, you know, my contributions today are going to be more on the animal side. I'm going to try to focus on, on how to kind of keep us, keep us in line with that forage program. But I just want to start out by pointing out that you know, and in the traditional winter calving uh, system in Missouri, we have to consider the relationship between cow requirements and the energy content in the in the forage. I, I focus on energy a lot rather than protein. I know a lot of people talk protein, but quite honestly, we run into more scenarios here in Missouri where we've got enough plenty of protein, not enough energy in our grasses, in our cool season grasses in particular. And so if you look at this, this graph that I've got here, we've got months of the year across the x-axis, and then we've got the y-axis is actually the energy concentration in the, in the cool season grasses and also the, the energy density of the diet need, needed to meet cow uh, requirements. The relationship between the two lines is, is vitally important. So, you know, quite simply, anytime that the black line, which represents the cow's nutrient requirements are above the green line, which represents the energy concentration in cool season grasses, then we have to fill that gap with supplement. We have to bring calories off the farm onto the farm to keep those cows um, in a body condition that is suitable for, for rebreeding. And you know, this might be an unpopular opinion, but quite frankly, you know, some of our nutritional challenges we create on our own by making the conspicuous choice to winter calve. When we winter calve, remember that a cow's nutrient requirements peak roughly 60 days post calving and that for her to calve every 365 days, she has to become pregnant with next year's calf within 85 days after calving we really sort of have a lot of important 
high nutrient demand events occurring in a relatively short window. And when we time those during a period of year when our grass, when our forage quality, when our forage energy density is at the lowest, then that's that's what forces us into these scenarios where we, we have to backfill with, with, you know, calories from off the farm. The second piece of that puzzle that I think is a complete unforced error on our part is the hay feeding system that we currently have where we focus on maximizing tonnage and we do little to nothing to to think about the quality of the hay that we're putting up we get in the field when it's convenient rather than when the forage is at at a greater quality and when we feed these cows low quality forage during this vitally important time you know that exacerbates that that deficit in, in energy. Now, how do we know when we have a deficit in energy and how that, how that relates to, to our cows? You know, it's, it's not like the cows get up every morning and um, step on the bathroom scale like some of us might. Um, you know, a lot of folks don't have access to a, a, an individual animal scale, you know, at all. So having some idea of, of weight change in a cow herd over time is, is difficult to, to envision. And so we have to rely on something else to be our, our barometer of nutritional status. That's where the idea or the concept of body condition scoring comes in. So historically, we've body condition scored cows on a one to nine scale, with one being severely emaciated, and nine being town dog fat. Now, the cow that's in the picture here is an example of a cow that's a body condition score three. So she would be on the thin end of things and you'll notice that she looks kind of sharp, angular, doesn't have a lot of fill, doesn't have a lot of muscle in her hind end. You can see some of her hip bones. You can see, you know, at least you can see ribs. I do want to point out that this this picture is uh, courtesy of the University of Minnesota, and we have used their body condition scoring pictures in a recent extension publication. Uh, Jordan Thomas put together a, a whole slew of uh, extension publications around reproductive management of beef cows, and this body condition scoring guide is, is in that. The, the link to that extension publication is below. If you have any trouble finding it, send me an email and I'll be happy to forward it on to you so that, that you have it on, um, you have access to it. Uh, the main thing I'm trying to drive at with this picture of a body condition score cow three is that this cow is, this is not acceptable. This is a cow that is likely to have a delay in the resuming of estrus the estrus cycle after calving. Now, what's the, what's the consequence of that? Well, the consequence of that is, has been documented, demonstrated in, in research for, for decades. The thinner the cows are when we body condition score them, the longer it takes them to, to resume estrus after calving. And you'll notice that According to the data from Houghton and others in 1990, a cow at a body condition score of three is going to take about 90 days to resume estrus. If we need her to stay on a 365 day calving interval, that's pretty unlikely to happen. And, and quite honestly, she'd be lucky to calve on the first cycle coming out of, um, out of an estrus. So, you know, if you see cows that were previously breeding early in the season, slipping for later and later in the calving season each year as the years go on, this could quite honestly be a reason that that's happening. You'll notice that cows that are at a body condition score five are, they resume estrus 30 days earlier. And on top of that, there looks to be little to no benefit of keeping those cows at a body condition score greater than five as the, the distance between five and six is much smaller than the distance between um, five and the others. Now, let's, let's think about this from a practical perspective for a second. 
if you have a couple of cows in the herd that are falling behind the others, that is not a reason to go out and spend a bunch of money to supplement or to change your program uh, to, to try and get those cows up back up on par. The average herd turns over about 15%, meaning we call about 15% of the cows from a herd in a given year. There are going to be some that, that just fall out for whatever reason, whether it's age, whether it's, you know, um, some kind of a, a, a disease, whether it's nutrition. I get more nervous about this body condition scoring when I see a herd that's full of threes and fours body condition score wise versus a herd that's got a lot of fives. And then we might have some threes that are kind of tail enders, you know, so think about it in the context of a, of a bell shaped curve. If, if our bell shaped curve is five, we're probably okay. If our average is five across the entire herd, we're probably okay. If our average is three across the herd, then, then we're in trouble. And again, the reason that I allude to that is when you look at the annual production cycle, she has to get bred in 85 days to have a calf every 365 days. But calving or parturition is associated with peak nutrient requirements in these cows. And so she needs as much feed, as many nutrients as she possibly can to support that nursing calf. Recall that a cow's lactation curve, the amount of milk that she produces per day will peak about 60 days post calving. Okay, so she is devoting a lot of nutrients towards milk production during this time, and she will prioritize milk production over, reproduct over reproductive function in a um, nutrient deficit environment, okay? So, so milk takes priority over getting bred with next year's calf, and, and reproduction is just always going to fall on the bottom of the nutrient uh, needs hierarchy. So putting these cows in a position to lose weight or having to spend the money to keep them from losing weight going into the breeding season is not an appealing prospect. I would rather have a thin cow that is gaining weight going into the breeding season as I would a fat cow who is losing weight going into the breeding season. So let's look at another one of these pictures now. And you, you contrast that to the body condition score three that I showed you just a minute ago. And this cow is an example of a body condition score five. So she's got more fill in her, in her rear end. You don't see uh, vertebrae across the top. The ribs, you might be able to faintly see them. You might not. She just looks fuller in general. Now, on the other hand, let's look at this cow. This is a body condition score seven. In environments like we have right now, where we are, are paying a lot of money for feed, if, if we have a high feed bill and a lot of cows like this, this is an opportunity for us to maybe sharpen our pencil and, and reevaluate some of the, the nutrition and management decisions that we're making. So now, that being said, if you're getting ready to, to, to go into the breeding season, now is probably not the time to... Um, you know, if you got an April one breeding, you've got body condition score seven cows, don't hear my message as lock those cows up in a dry lot and only let them graze two to four hours a day and to pull some weight off of them. If we make them lose a couple of body condition scores between now and the, the start of the breeding season, that's just as bad as them being too thin. So, you know, there will be other opportunities to peel a little excess flesh off those cows let's let's keep them maintained where they are for now with their feeding program and look maybe to to cut later on so um you know going back to this how do we know what target we're trying to hit especially in in an environment where, where feed's so expensive i like to use a couple of rules of thumb for for nutrition for any of you that have gotten hay tests done you know if your hay is testing less than 55 percent tdn total digestible nutrients that's our bench top measurement of energy. It's inadequate to meet the nutrient requirements of a beef cow, regardless of how much access to hay that she has, okay? Because 
cow intake, feed intake is limited by the, the size of the gut, by gut fill. She'll stop eating once her gut gets full. If I'm, if I'm trying to get her fat on salads, it's a completely different prospect than if I'm trying to make her, you know, ribeye steaks and, and very nutrient dense feedstuffs. Low quality forage, 55% TDN or le less than 55% TDN will not meet the requirements for a pregnant and definitely not for a lactating cow. On the other hand, a 55 TDN hay that's fed to cows that are at peak lactation without supplement is also going to be, be deficient. Um, you know, we really need to be thinking about how we're going to get, get a little more energy into, into those cows in a case like that. Focus on energy. I, I talk a lot about energy with producers because I think we spend too much time worrying about protein, 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 when in our environment, we're rarely lacking in protein. I'll see fescue hay that'll test 46 to 48% TDN and still have eight, nine percent crude protein in it. Pro energy is our first limiting nutrient. So let's quickly just go through a, 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 an example. I know that we're in, we're in muddy March and we are eagerly awaiting the prospect of turning cows out onto green grass. I just wanna reiterate Tim Schnockenberg's point of give those cows an extra or give those pastures an extra two weeks before you turn cattle out. Don't turn cattle out onto pastures the first at the first hint of green. If you allow those pastures to develop a full complement of leaves, if you allow them to get six, seven inches of forage growth before you turn cattle out onto it, you are going to do your forage system a world of good. You're gonna make more forage over the course of the entire year if you don't get greedy and try to harvest the early forage. And if you do, if you're just simply out of hay and you need to turn those cows out, try to use only one pasture as kind of a sacrifice that gets grazed down early. Don't spread your cows out over every pasture you've got because you'll cripple the ability of all of your pastures to, um, you know, replenish root carbohydrates and develop that full complement of leaves and all of those benefits that are going to equate to increased forage production this year without any additional inputs in terms of fertilizer or, or things along those lines. That's my little sidetrack. Let's look at an example of a February 1 calving cow that's being fed a 50% TDN fescue hay with 8% crude protein. The book says that that cow is going to eat about 30 pounds of hay a day and that she'll need a ration that um, should have at least 55% uh, TDN. Um, in a case like that, we're going to need 20% of her feed to come from a, a, uh, from a feed with at least 80% TDN to balance the, inadequate, the inadequacies of the energy concentration of the hay. What that might look like is, is four pounds per day of a, of a commodity mix, a cracked corn distillers, uh, soy hull or gluten, you know, some combination of the four. So, you know, roughly four pounds per cow per day of that commodity mix, or if you're just doing soy holes by themselves, roughly six pounds of soy holes per day. Now, let's assume that we're doing the commodity mix and that it costs you 15 cents a pound, $15 a hundred weight or $300 a ton you're looking at 60 to 75 cents per cow per day in supplement just to meet her energy requirement because of the inadequacies of the hay that's being fed. The best thing you can do for your forage program in 2022 to buck the expensive feed prices that we're seeing that we're likely to continue to see is to Feed as little of that expensive supplement as you can. Focus on high quality forage. Get somebody to wrap baleage for you rather than putting up your own dry hay this year, even if it costs a little more to do baleage. The reason that I say baleage is not because baleage has more nutrients than hay. Baleage harvested on the same day as dry hay will have similar nutrient compositions. But if baleage allows you to get in the field during the wettest month of the year, and harvest a higher quality forage than you would otherwise, waiting till you know, the middle of June to get in there and harvest dry hay, 
you could be looking at saving some significant money on on your supplement costs this coming winter. So just to wrap it up right quick, key points, you know, poor quality hay is sort of exacerbating the need for expensive supplement programs, but we need the expensive supplement programs because we've designed our, our beef cattle production system out of sync with our forage production system. And, and any time that we put, you know, peak nutrient requirement cows, peak lactation cows on low quality hay or on dormant pastures and they lose body condition score, that's going to, at best case scenario, it's going to change our calving distribution. We're gonna have more calves born later. Worst case scenario, we're gonna have poor pregnancy rates. And if you take one thing away from my presentation today, take this last bullet point. A, the best cow-calf operations are going to allow grazed forage to absorb as much of a cow's nutrient needs as possible and provide as little purchased and raised feed as possible. You have time between now and the next winter feeding season to make some very impactful decisions that will allow you to reduce the amount of hay that you feed to feed higher quality hay when you do have to feed hay or perhaps to to really evaluate when the optimum calving season is within your forage system to allow yourself to to allow the, your forage program to absorb as much of the nutritional needs of a beef cow as possible that's all I've got for today. I'd be happy to take a couple questions. I know I ran about five minutes long. Apologies, everybody. Um, I'd be happy to, to answer that. Thank you very much. Um, uh, we want to encourage anyone who has questions to type those in the chat. We did have one uh, question that came into the chat during the program, and I'll, I'll read the, uh, the question and the response uh, that came in a couple, a couple of our um, uh, people on, who were online were able to answer uh, part of this question as well. So uh, the question was, any Missouri data on plant growth regulator products like Rise Up, which is a gibberellic acid uh, product? Uh, specifically, the data says these products will increase tonnage. Uh, does that impact nutrient density of the forage and any impact on grass tetany type of issues? And Ryan Locke replied that uh, they did evaluate rise up and could not detect a benefit to yield in tall fescue red clover uh, pasture. And Tim Schnockenberg replied that in 2011 in South Central Missouri, uh, they uh, did a, a study as well as in 2019 or in 2009. Um, and in both cases, they did not confirm a production benefit. Uh, he did not know of any effect on endophyte. Um, so if there are uh, if anyone else has uh, information they would like to share, please unmute and do that at this time. And uh, if anyone else has a question, please type that into the chat at this time. Um, a response came in that uh, from Tim Schnockenberg on no knowledge of tetany effects uh, in either uh, of the trial trials that he was aware of. So do we have any other questions? No, I have not received any more questions so far, Valerie. All right. Um, so um, with that, I think we will uh, conclude uh, the program today. I want to invite everyone to join us in future programs. Uh, we are going to start in April having this uh, town hall on the second and fourth Thursdays of each month. And so our next program uh, will be on April, uh, I believe it is the 14th. Um, also, as you can uh, register to receive an email notification about the, about the program, if you go uh, to the ipm.missouri.edu website, you can register there so that you would uh, have the opportunity to participate uh, via Zoom and ask questions uh, during the live program as well as uh, get an email notification about the upcoming program. So that uh, is the advantage of registering uh, through the town hall uh, website. Um, any, any questions, Druba, that have come in before we sign off? No, not any question. All right, thank you very much. And we appreciate everyone joining us today. Look forward to seeing you on April the 14th.